Good morning, VCC family and friends. Uh, thanks for joining with me this morning to share God's word. We're excited to be with you, even if it's not exactly the way we had hoped. We're, we're, we're taking a step backwards, it may feel like, but we're still going to move on in, in studying God's word and specifically continuing our series called The Road to Freedom. This morning, we're going to look at our third signpost called The Need for a Response. And uh, this morning, I would like to start in our source text. I know I said that we would be preaching the theme, but not the lesson. And I'm not going to preach the lesson that you've seen or will be seeing in your small group shortly. But I, I do want to share that text. I want to use the same text this morning. And so that's Exodus chapter 3. If you have a Bible, you can go there now. And if you just want to listen, I'll, I'll read the six verses we're going to look at uh, together, starting in verse 1 to 6. Now Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to the mountain of God to Horeb. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from within a bush. He looked and the bush was ablaze with fire, but it was not being consumed. So Moses thought, I will turn aside to see this amazing sight. Why does the bush not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from within the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. God said, do not approach any closer. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you are standing is holy ground. He added, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The author makes it clear that the key moment in this passage is when Moses turns aside to look closer. When Moses approaches the phenomenon that he's seeing. When Moses lets his intrigue and his desire to seek the truth of what's going, that's when God calls out to him. And this shows such a, a, an interesting and perhaps peculiar component to God's personality. God, the almighty, the omnipotent creator of the universe, waits for Moses to make the first move. He waits for Moses to take a step before calling out to him. Now, uh, I'm not saying God is always like this. Of course, he sent his son while all of us uh, were lost. Um, God loved the world before the world loved him. And so I'm not saying this is always true, but in this passage, I just find it so interesting that, that God, uh, when he sees Moses' desire to move closer, that's when he calls out. That's when he, he says his name. He, he says it twice with passion, with desire, with uh, emphasis. And then he says, take off your shoes and, and just let's spend some time together here. What a beautiful encounter. What a beautiful truth about being free with God. That when we draw near to him, he draws near to us. Now, perhaps uh, you might be saying, yeah, but... He saw this burning bush. Um, you know, he had this uh, motivation. I, I'm cold. I'm indifferent. I'm lukewarm. I'm, 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 I'm backsliding. I'm, I'm feeling indifferent towards God. How, how can I call out to God? How can I approach God when I just don't feel it? Well, Moses, on this day, he's been in this wilderness for 40 years. We know about the 40 years he spends with the Israelites, but sometimes we gloss over the fact that he lived with his father-in-law and his wife for 40 years. He was in essence hiding from his, uh, from his people and from his background and from his heritage. He had murdered a man and then he had fled. He had run away. And now he has this job. He has this family. He, he's married into a foreign country and he's living in this land that's not his own. And, and he, if any of us, has an excuse to be indifferent, to be cold. But here he is in the moment that God has ordained for him. 
in the middle of his hiding, in the middle of his indifference towards God, God creates this uh, circumstance. And when Moses responds, God responds to him. And it's not just for Moses that uh, the circumstances don't justify us. In Deuteronomy uh, chapter 4, verses 27 to 29, uh, the Lord says, well, Moses writes about the Lord. He says, then the Lord will scatter you among the peoples and there you will be for very, uh, there will be very few of you among the nations where the Lord will drive you. There you will worship gods made by human hands, wood and stone that can neither see, hear, eat, nor smell. But if you seek the Lord your God from there, you will find him. If indeed you seek him with all your heart and soul. Did we notice that first part? You'll be in a foreign land. There will be few of you. You'll be worshiping other gods. This doesn't sound like a, a Christian conference with the music playing where we seek God. This sounds like very difficult circumstances to seek God, but that's exactly the context that God desires people to seek him from. God desires people caught in other beliefs. He desires people who are not surrounded by a community of, of people uh, whooping them up and encouraging them on. He desires the, the soul which is captive to other desires and other ways of life to call out to him and to seek him. And the promise is that if we seek him in that place, if we seek him in that way, he will be found. He will allow us to hear his voice, to see his face, and to feel his presence if we will do that. And so our indifference, our circumstances, they don't get us off the hook from seeking God. And notice that it pleases God when we seek him. He desires people to seek him. In Psalms 53 verse 2, it says, God looks down from heaven at the human race to see if there is anyone who is wise and seeks God. I mean, that's something that God loves. God desires people who seek him. I can uh, please God's heart when I seek him. So often as Christians, we assume if we're obedient and if we do the top 10 things Christians should do, that will please him. And, and of course, he, he likes us to obey him. Of course, he, he likes to see the character of his son in our lives. Of course, he loves to see his children being righteous and being faithful. But even when we're not in that place, even when we are perhaps backsliding or, or lukewarm, there's still a way that we can please him if we seek him, if we look for him, if we search for him with our whole hearts, then he will allow us to find him. In uh, one of my favorite passages of the New Testament, one of my favorite narratives, Paul is in Athens, in Greece, speaking to a, a group of men who pride themselves on searching for truth, on, on seeking for, for what is true. And he stands up in the midst of one of their great meeting places. And in Acts 17 and in verse uh, 26 and 27, he says this to these gr this group of men, these men. From one man, he made every nation of the human race to inhabit the entire earth, determining their set times and the fixed limits of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope around for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. I love this verse. It tells me that my, my, my ethnicity, my gender, my age, my geographical location, that it's all orchestrated by God to allow my soul the greatest possibility of finding God, of, of connecting with God, like all the circumstances of my life, the good and the bad, the blessings and the tough times, all of the, the heartaches and the joys, all of the successes and all of the failures, that they can all contribute to my soul being able to seek and find the Lord. Like, like do we believe this? I mean, Moses, he, 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 as we've said, he was, 
He was hiding from a murder that he had committed. He was married in, into another culture, into a, another way of living. He'd been running for 40 years, and that still wasn't enough to get him away from the love of God. I mean, what happened on that day that motivated him to bring the sheep to the base of Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, the very place where he would bring the Israelites not too long after to seek God and to find God, to, to bring the people on their road of freedom to the base of that mountain. What, what, what made him on that morning go? It, it was God. God set the boundaries, set the geographical limits of where Moses was hiding and where Moses was living his, his, his new life. And God orchestrated it to give him an opportunity to seek and to find him. If you look at the Old Testament revivals, every time there was a, a, a king that did evil, not too long after there would be a king that would bring revival, that would cause the people to, to, to pray. And, and the, the common line in the scriptures in every one of those revivals was that the people started to seek after God. The people turned away from their sin and sought God. The most famous prayer in the Old Testament, perhaps, is King Solomon's prayer. And he says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn away from their wicked ways and seek after me, seek after my face, then I will listen to their prayers and I will heal their land. And so this, this seeking after God, this is the response that God is after. This is the this is a, the true indication of my freedom. We, we said at the start that this series would give us signposts that we could self-evaluate, self-assess our freedom. How much do I seek after God? And when I do seek after him, is it intense? Is it passionate? Is it with all of my heart? And if it's not, then I'm not truly being free. I'm not experiencing the freedom that God wants for me. It was for freedom that Christ Jesus has set me free. Freedom to do what? Freedom to live life, yes, but freedom to worship Him. Freedom to enter His presence boldly. Freedom to pursue Him and to seek after Him that He then would respond and draw close to me. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful plea for relationship that we have in this signpost. It's a beautiful promise of intimacy that we have if we will just humble ourselves and seek after him with all of our heart, we will receive these blessings. The writer to the Hebrews says in chapter 11, verse 6, Now without faith it is impossible to please him, for the one who approaches God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So we kind of hear the, um, the, the contingency here. No, that's not the right word. We hear the, the condition here. We must do this, we must do that. But there's actually a beautiful promise embedded if we can see beyond the ifs and the buts here. There's a beautiful promise here. It says that he rewards those who seek him. He wants us to seek him, not with this like, oh, I'm so sorry I sinned, even though repentance can be part of our search for God. He wants us to seek him with this heart of, man, I'm going for him. I'm going to reach out and grab him. I'm going to enter his presence boldly. And then he's going to reward me. He's going to reward me. He's going to bless me with his presence. I'm going to feel his presence in my heart. I'm going to hear his voice. I'm going to see his face. I'm going to be overwhelmed with the intimacy of God. I, I pursue him believing that he will reward me. I'm not talking prosperity gospel stuff here. I'm talking about reward me with the blessing of himself. Jesus himself said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find Knock, and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. 
Every single prophet in the Old Testament talks about seeking the Lord. I mean, the whole prophecy of Amos focuses on this central theme. Isaiah, the, even the psalmist, they all talk about the essential nature of seeking God and living because of that. My search for God should not be religious. It should not just be five minutes before bedtime. It should not just be when I'm in church. It should be a way of life. As Paul says, we pray continuously. I talk with God continuously. This is how I demonstrate my true freedom. And if it's a, a chore to seek after him, if it's a chore uh, to remember to have time in the day for him, I'm not here to lay a guilt trip on anybody. I'm just here to say that that's probably a really good indication that we're not truly free, that our freedom has not been rooted and established in our hearts yet. And so let's hear the word of God this morning. Let's remember that seeking God is not a, a daily discipline that I should track and, and count the minutes that I do it. Seeking God should be something that I do with all of my heart, all of my passion, all of my soul, and expecting to be rewarded with the blessing of Him and who He is in my life. Amen. God bless His word to our hearts this morning. And I trust that you will uh, continue to pray with us that God will open up the doors for us to get back together soon. I'm hoping that this will not be uh, a setback for too long, but that we will turn the corner on this thing and that this virus will, will be uh, crushed and that people will find freedom from this. And when we go back uh, to living a life that we that believe in God won't be going back, but we'll be going forwards. And so I pray this morning that the word of God can encourage uh, your heart and your day and your week. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye for now. God bless.